In order to get started working with Postgres, we need two components. First, the Postgres server that'll house our data and manage connections, security, and maintenance of the data. Second, we need a way to communicate with the server so that we can work with and view the data that it contains. For this, we'll need a management application, or what's sometimes referred to as a front-end client. There are lots of different clients that we can use to interface with a Postgres server. But the easiest way to get started is to use an installer that gives us both components in one step. We'll start the installation at the URL postgresql.org. This is the official site for Postgres, and there's lots of good information on this page. You can find information about joining some user groups or the latest news about development. I recommend bookmarking this page and coming back when you have some time and simply explore all of the resources that are available. For now though, let's scroll back up to the top of the page and click on the big download button. There's a number of different application installers that are available depending on what operating system you're working with. If you're working on a Linux machine, it's likely that you already have a version of Postgres available to you since it comes pre-installed with the OS. The instructions that you'll find at these links will help you install an alternate version if you need to. The installation for Mac OS and Windows is almost identical. I'm working on a Windows computer, so I'm going to click on the Windows link. That takes me to a page that describes what versions of Postgres are available on each platform, either 64-bit or 32-bit. The current version of Postgres at the time of this recording is version 12. After viewing the platform support information, you can click on the link up here that says download the installer. This takes you to a page that's maintained by a company called Enterprise DB. Finally, here we can choose which version of Postgres we want. I'll choose the downloader for Postgres 12.2 by clicking on the download link underneath Windows. If there's a newer version available for you, feel free to download that instead. It shouldn't make a difference for this course. Once the download is completed, as I can see down here at the bottom of my screen, we can go ahead and close the web browser and start the installation process. You should find the file inside of the downloads folder for your computer. We'll go ahead and double click on it to start it up. I'll allow it to make changes to my computer. And while that's starting up, I'm going to close out of the downloads folder. So that starts the setup wizard. Let's press the next button on this screen. The default installation directory is going to be on my computer inside of the program files folder, a new folder for PostgreSQL, and then the version 12. I'll just leave the default and press next. Here we have four different components that we can install. The PostgreSQL server is the main component, so I want to make sure that that's turned on. We have two interface clients that are coming along. pgadmin4 is a graphical user interface, and I'll leave that on, as well as the command line tools, and I'll leave those on as well. Stack Builder is a tool that'll help you install additional add-on packages if you're interested in extending Postgres's capabilities. I'll go ahead and press the Next button. Next, it sets up a default data directory, and once again on my computer that's in Program Files, PostgreSQL, 12, and then a new folder called Data. I'll just choose that default and press Next. Now, in order to connect to the server, we'll need to have a user account. Here, the installer is creating a default user that's named Postgres, and we need to create a password for this user. You can type in whatever password you'd like, just make sure that you remember it moving forward. This user account is going to be an administrator level account, so this user will have permission to do anything on the server. Once you've typed in the password and retyped the same password, press the next button. The default port that Postgres will communicate on is 5432. We'll just leave that there and press next. And on this screen, we get to choose a default location. Once again, I'll leave this as default locale and press next. That'll give me an installation summary. I'll press the next button and then next one more time to install the software. When that finishes up, the database server and client applications have been installed. Now, if you chose to install the Stack Builder application as well, you can turn off this checkbox here. We don't need to run Stack Builder when we finish out of this wizard. I'll go ahead and press the Finish button. That'll dismiss everything. And now I can go into my Start menu, and I'm going to scroll down and find the new folder that was just added for PostgreSQL 12. Inside of here, we have a couple of applications. The ones that I want to focus on are pgadmin4. This is a graphical user interface for Postgres that'll run inside of your web browser. 
I'm going to right click on that and choose pin it to start for easy access. The other one I want to look at is called SQL Shell or PSQL. I'm going to right click on that and pin that to start menu as well. This is a command line tool that's popular with programmers. On Mac OS, you'll find the PostgreSQL 12 folder inside of your applications folder, and inside of there will be the same PG admin and PSQL applications. So now we have Postgres Server, as well as a couple of client applications available for us to work with. The PSQL Shell is a command line interface for working with Postgres database servers. It provides a quick way for administrators to log into the server and run commands, but it's not the most user-friendly environment for new users, since it requires that you know what commands you want to run and how to type them out. However, I do think that it's important to see briefly in order to help reinforce the idea that the client application is completely separate from the database server, and PSQL is a very important tool in the world of Postgres development. So let's go ahead and click on it to start it up. When you first run the tool, it opens up a command line window and starts the login process. In order to log into a Postgres server, you need to know some connection details. First, it asks for the server location. If you're in a typical office environment where the Postgres server is running on a centralized computer, then you'll need the IP address of that machine. In our case, we're running the server and client on the same physical machine, so we can use the word localhost instead. You can either type that in or simply press enter and localhost, the default as indicated by the text in square brackets, will be used instead. I'll just leave this blank and press enter to enter in localhost. Next, it asks you which database you want to connect to. Each Postgres server can hold many different databases. Our server is brand new and there's just one database called Postgres, so I'll log into that one. Again, you can press enter to accept the default value of Postgres. Next, we need the communication port that the server is listening on. This was set up during the installation step, but is typically left at the default of 5432. I'll press enter to accept that value. Then we need to provide the user account credentials. Again, during the installation, we created a super user account named Postgres, so we'll use that. If you've been assigned your own personal user account for your server, you would supply that username here instead. And finally, the user's password. Again, we gave the Postgres user account a password during setup, so I hope that you remember what you filled in during that step. Go ahead and type it in now. When you type, it's not going to appear on the screen, so just type it out and press enter when you're done. If everything was filled in correctly, you should be connected to the Postgres server and the command prompt will change. Now we can start sending commands to the server. One thing that we can do is get details about the installation. We can do that by running select, version, and then an open and close parenthesis. Select is a SQL command that returns information, and we're using a built-in function called version to pull out the server version and installation platform information. All of these commands are going to finish with a semicolon to tell the server that we're done typing and to go ahead and execute the statement. When you press enter, you should get a similar result. I'm working with Postgres version 12.2, and it was compiled by Visual C++ on Windows. Another command that we can send is to ask for the current date and time. That uses a function called now. So once again, I'll say select, the function now, open and close parenthesis, and a closing semicolon. If you were to omit the semicolon, Postgres doesn't know that you've finished with the command, and when you press enter, it simply goes down to line number two. You can type the semicolon here on line number two, and Postgres will then execute your statement when you press enter. That'll reveal the exact time and date that I'm recording this movie. Okay, so we can run commands on the server and get back some information. Let's create a database to work in. We can do that with the create database command. We'll follow this with the name of the database that we want to create. Let's call it favorite colors. When you press enter, it returns create database that tells me that the database was created successfully. To see a list of all of the databases on the server, type backward slash and then a lowercase letter L. This isn't a SQL command, so you don't need a semicolon at the end, just press enter, and you'll see a list of all the different databases that are on the current Postgres server. 
There is the default Postgres database, we have a couple of template databases, and then we have the database favorite colors that we just created. In order to work with the favorite colors database, we need to switch into it. Remember that when we logged into the server, we logged into the Postgres database. To switch contexts, use backward slash C, and then the name of the database, favorite colors. That tells me that I'm now connected to the database favorite colors as the user Postgres. So we've disconnected from the first database and connected to the second. You'll notice that the command prompt has changed to indicate that the database that we're connected to is now favorite colors. At this point, we can add a table to this database. We do that with the create table command. The table I want to create is called colors, and then I'll open up a parenthesis. In order to create a table, we need to define the different columns that'll make up the table. The first column in this table will be called color ID, and it'll store integer values, or INT. These are just basic numbers. So that defines the first column in the table. I'll type in a comma, and the name of the second column in the table. I'll call it color name. This column will store text data, or character data. I'll type in char, and I want it to be able to store up to 20 characters. So inside of parentheses, I'll type in the number 20 and a closing parenthesis. That finishes the definition of the two columns for my table. I'll type in another closing parenthesis and a closing semicolon. Let's press enter, and Postgres tells me that the table was created. With the simple table in place, we can start to store some data into it. To do that, we use insert into. I'm going to insert into the colors table, and I'm going to insert some values. This will allow me to add rows of data to the table. I'll open up a parenthesis, and the first row will be the number one, followed by the text red. Text in Postgres is going to get entered inside of single quotation marks. So there is my first row. I'll close out the parenthesis, type in a comma, open a parenthesis, and we can type in the values for the second row of data. This will be two and the text blue. Let's add one more, the number three, followed by the text green. That finishes the insert into statement, so I'll close the semicolon and press enter. Postgres tells me that three records were inserted, and now I can review that information by typing in select star from colors. This command asks for everything from that table, and we can see that the table is made up of two columns and that it contains three pieces of data. So what we've just done is write out several commands in a language called Structured Query Language, or SQL, and it's the primary way that database developers and users will interact with relational databases. <laughs>